unresolved issues with the government. Few act upon it radically, few use rationality. While most of us linger on the subject of sustainability of the government in the long run, others would love to find out if the interest of the Rakyat is ever on the government's seemingly parochial agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our unbiased thoughts into the discussion on the Malaysian metamorphosis between our very own DPM, Yang Ahmad Bahagia, Tan Tun Sri Mujidin Yassin, and the sixth MSLS project director, Mr. Shawal Hafriz. Testing. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to Yang Ahmad Berhormat Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, the Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia, UKEC and MS responses and fellow friends. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear now that the brand of metamorphosis that we are championing is no mere lip service. The resolutions passed during our group discussions have shown unanimity amongst those who are in attendance today. However, ladies and gentlemen, a key element in the form of changes is patience. Rome was not built in a day. Any force development will just be limiting on itself and cause to be a hindrance towards the advancements that it was trying to achieve. And with this in mind, it is safe to say that the foundation for this has been set, starting with our approach to this matter. It is now up to us to decide where we are going to go with this. Fellow participants and friends, the world is our oyster. Stagnation will lead to degradation, degradation of a society which can only be cured by sustainable development. For the past two days, MSLS has brought together student leaders from all over and have produced two key areas which the students have unanimously decided upon with consensus during their lively group discussions which are what we should contribute to the country and what the country can offer to us in return. committee thank you once again for all of you who are here today we look forward to hosting you at the next edition of MSLS now I would like to present the stage to the Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia Yang Ahmad Bohamad Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin for the closing address of the sixth Malaysian Student Leaders Summit 2012 the Malaysian Metamorphosis please let's have a round of applause
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera dan salam satu Malaysia Mr. Chairman Ladies and gentlemen First I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Chairman and the committee members of the United Kingdom and IA Council of the Malaysian students for inviting me uh, to speak at the closing ceremony of the Sixth Malaysian Student Leaders Summit this evening. I must commend the leadership of UKC for your endless endeavor to pursue the idea of organizing this important summit every year. The perseverance in organizing this event reflects on your passion and your sincerity as young leaders to contribute to the future progress and development of our beloved country. Furthermore, as Malaysia is experiencing rapid economic and social progress in this crucial period of our country's transition from developing to developed nation status, this gathering of young minds become all the more important. As young leaders, I'm sure you have a lot of fresh and new ideas on how to make this transition successful and move our country to the next level of development. And this summit is indeed the right avenue for all of you to exchange great ideas and on top of that, make your voice heard. But the theme of my speech, which is the closing speech, of course, is Malaysian metamorphosis, is both timely and relevant. It aptly describes the process of economic, political, and social transformation that our country has experienced in the past and the kind of transformation that is currently underway. The word metamorphosis, which literally means mark change in form, in structure, in substance, clearly reflects the change that our country had undergone over the past 50 years. Now, if you were to reflect on these changes, we'll find that our country has experienced remarkable changes. We have moved from an agricultural-based post-colonial state, which was deeply divided by ethnicity at the time of independence, to one of the fastest growing and most stable developing nations in the world today. Our per capita income has increased from a meager 230 US dollars in 1957 to 9,700 US dollars this year. Now with the rising income and growing economy, we were in the better position to distribute wealth equitably, especially among the poor. As a result, we have managed to reduce poverty level for more than 50% in 1957 to less than 4% today. Now, currently, the government is not only looking to ways to reduce the incidences of poverty, but also to raise the income level of all Malaysians. And this is particularly crucial to the attainment of our national goal to transform Malaysia into a fully, fully developed and high-income nation by 2020. As such, our government has rolled out a comprehensive economic transformation program that will generate new wealth, create 
new jobs and eventually increase the incomes of all Malaysians. With sound economic management and sustained growth, we are convinced that our per capita income will reach 15,000 US dollars by the year 2020, inshallah. Now, apart from the economy, remarkable progress has also been made in the area of education. In the early days of independence, our primary enrollment rate stood at a low of 40%. But today, with expanding access to basic education, including in the interior of Sabah and Sarawak, we have managed to increase primary enrollment rate to 96%. With better access to basic education, we have witnessed rapid expansion of educated, skilled and productive, productive workforce over the past decades that serve as the bedrock of our robust economic growth. But expanding access to basic education alone is insufficient. As our country needs highly knowledgeable and talented workforce to propel the nation forwards in the knowledge and innovation-driven economy, we must further improve the quality of our education. And therefore, concerted efforts are now being done to enhance the quality of our education through a comprehensive review process that will substantially change the way education is delivered to our future young generations. We will place more emphasis on students' ability to develop their thinking skills and enhance their creative talents rather than simply teaching them to memorize facts and figures. Now, significant developments have also emerged in the area of politics. In the early days of independence, the political space was rather limited largely due to the looming threat of communist insurgencies and the possibilities of ethnic violence. But today, as the threat of communist insurgencies no longer exists and Malaysians of all races live harmoniously alongside each other, we find that the political space is widening and as part of the political transformation process that is currently underway, the government has abolished the Internal Security Act, amended the University and University Colleges Act, introduced the Peaceful Assembly Act, just to name a few, in order to allow greater space for political participations and a healthy public dissent. Now, I'm certain that the opening up of political space augurs well for the proliferation of democratic practices in our country. It makes the government more accountable to the people and, of course, more responsive to their needs and aspirations. It also compels people to voice their views and opinions in a more civilized and respectable manner, which form the cornerstone of any democratic society. Thus, in line with the People First Performance Now concept that is currently adopted by the Barisan National Government, I strongly believe that a new political development will steer the government and the society in a more democratic direction. Furthermore, we know that today, the day that government knows everything is over. Yes, it is true that government must know more than the people it governs. Otherwise, it will soon become obsolete and incompetent. But to expect the government to know everything, of course, is just untenable. The complexity of knowledge creation and the speed of its dissemination warrant the government to consult the experts and engage the people on a larger scale to find out better ways to govern the country. Now, the Malaysian government is doing just that. It is currently 
engaging the people through the various meet the people sessions, town hall meetings and dialogues, to solicit public opinions and issues of national interest, improvement in education, new ways to fight crimes and corruption, efforts to reduce or trace the income of the poor, reduce the cost of living, enhance urban public transport, and improve rural basic infrastructures, among others, are all the results of public consultations. I must say that with this new approach of governing, the space for participatory, participatory democracy and civil society engagement in Malaysia will become more vibrant. In short, we look back 50 years ago, if we look back 50 years ago, we'll find that Malaysia today is markedly different from Malaysia then. There have been substantial changes to the Malaysian economy, to Malaysian society, educations and politics. And today, of course, Malaysians not only enjoy better education, better income and better life, but also greater access to political space. So if you were to ask me whether there has been a Malaysian metamorphosis of sort, I will of course surely answer with a resounding yes. Now while Malaysian metamorphosis is real, not superficial, we must bear in mind that the word metamorphosis itself connotes that the process of change is not abrupt, but rather evolutionary. Indeed, it is the evolutionary process of economic, political, and social changes that makes Malaysia stand out from the rest of the developing world. We enjoy rapid economic development without sacrificing the institutions of democratic and constitutional government. We allow comparative politics to take root in our multiracial and multi-religious society without sacrificing political stability. And most important of all, we continue to enjoy racial harmony and social cohesion while steering our government and society in a more democratic direction. Some countries, of course, are less fortunate as their journey to democracy is marked by civil wars, ethnic violence, social uprisings, and even foreign occupation. The people have to endure political repressions, economic deprivations, and social marginalizations before they can taste democracy. Even Western advanced democracies have to endure a long and winding road to be where they are today. We are rather fortunate that in Malaysia, the journey towards democratic government is not marked by civil war, by ethnic violence or bloodshed, but rather by evolutionary process of significant improvements in education, economic progress, and political maturity. It is better education, sustained economic development, and a vibrant civil society that make Malaysians more aware of their rights and responsibilities as citizens of a democratic nations. Now, on top of this, I believe the uniquely Malaysian political culture that values liberty and stability, prosperity and security, equality and harmony, makes the journey towards a stable democratic government possible. This political culture provides a sense of stability, a sense of certainty and security to the people which in turn form the basis of political order. We have to bear in mind that a stable democratic government is simply unattainable in the absence of political order. As young leaders, it is my fervent hope that you will treasure the Malaysian experience of preserving political order in its journey to enhance democratic governance. And this is the main lesson that we can draw 
formulation metamorphosis. Over 55 years of experience in maintaining political stability, racial harmony and economic affluence is replete with knowledge and wisdom that will guide us to steer our nations in the path of sustained peace and prosperity. Finally, I would like to once again congratulate the leadership of UKC and the organizing committee for a successful hosting of this summit. I believe your sincere and of course precious effort will go a long way in creating a better future for Malaysia and its people. I thank you. Thank you very much to Yamat Bohomad Tan Simudin Yassin for the closing address of the 6th annual MSLS. Now we shall begin the question and answer session. I will now open the session for the floor. So I will accept two questions at one time. Please state your name and institution and please keep your question short and sweet. So let's begin with the gentleman on my right in front. Hi, my name is uh, Wen Kai from Taylor's College, Subang Jaya. Assalamu alaikum, Tan Sri. I would like to draw your attention to the brain drain issue. What steps can the Education Ministry take to curb brain drain? Thank you for the question. Now, can I have the lady on my left? Hi, my name is Nicole. I'm from University of Nottingham. I'd like to ask about your opinions on the implementation of provisions for students with learning disabilities, a group that we acknowledge has been not largely neglected in Malaysia. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the first question, of course, is something which has been, of course, uh, debated and discussed uh, for many, many years. And uh, the concern of not only the people, of course, the government, that the so-called uh, good brain move out of the country. Now, uh, of course, uh, what we're trying to do, of course, now, we have first uh, set up what we call the talent corporations. This is a positive move by the government to deal with this issue, not on an ad hoc basis, it has been done before, but with concerted effort, with... Uh, offers of incentive and a way to draw this talent back home. The setting up of this talent corporation, which uh, were incorporated just about two years ago, is starting to bear fruit. Basically, of course, uh, we would like to see first and foremost, of course, to ensure that students like you, who studies abroad, who has gained all the knowledge and, of course, has got the qualifications to come back home to serve the nations. I had, uh, on a number of occasions, the opportunity to meet our students abroad in the UK. The last uh, week was in Indonesia, and telling them that uh, with this massive or major transformation plan that government has taken now, and it's been rolled out, we have mentioned that we need a total investment of more than 400 odd billion. This will create a 3.3 million new workforce. Of course, what we need is the qualified, trained, skilled manpower. Where will this come from? It has to first come from Malaysians. Be they Malaysians who are now in the country, of course, going through the process of higher education in local universities, or those who are abroad, studying, of course, some, of course, working abroad to say now there are opportunities back home. There are a lot of jobs that have been offered that suits you. I was in Washington in a session like this and one Malaysian was asking me if I come home, can I continue to do the research work that I've been working with some of the institutions in the US? Well, I see the first and most important thing is there must be an intention for you to serve the country. Obviously, there are more opportunities now than before where universities set up funds to allow uh, whether local students or people who are brought to experience to continue to do research work in whatever field that you want. So basically there is much more firm initiative now. Uh, you can browse through the website of Talent Corporation that will tell you exactly what has been in store 
For example, coming home, uh, of course, if you are married with a foreigner, you can bring your wife along. Surely you, have, you can't leave your wife behind. You can bring your kids, and of course, you're allowed to bring cars. There's a certain incentive that's been provided, aside from ensuring that you got a reasonably good job. Because some of you must have been serving abroad with some position and been paid higher salary. And you said, if I come home, do I get a similar salary? Of course, you can't get similar salaries. That is in US dollars here in Ringgit. But it must be reasonable, comparing to the cost of living in some of the countries and the standard of living that we have in Malaysia, it could be reasonable. Though in terms of real income, it is much lower. So basically, there is the, now the initiative taken to ensure that with this move, your so-called brain will not be draining out of the country. What we are talking about now is brain gain, that bringing back the so-called expert that we have among Malaysians overseas. Now, the second question, of course, uh, yes, we do not sort of uh, uh, set aside or we do not sort of take care or given fair attention to those people who are disabled, be it in the government, be it in so-called education ministry, because this has been part and parcel of our government policy. We would like that they be fairly treated, the fact that they are disabled. In Bahasa Malaysia, they call it orang kurang upaya. Uh, they are special people. And being special, they need special attention. They need special support. For example, in Ministry of Education, we have a system of actually identifying kids from the very early age in the lower schools or in the primary school to see whether they are able to cope with their education in the classroom. We do this, what we call the, the test. Literacy and numeracy, numeracy test, Linus, Linus test. And in that standard, we can then identify whether they have any disabilities, they are slow learners, or the certain attentions that need to be given to them. And they are then being set into special classroom with special teachers who have got special training. And of course, if they are uh, what are called needs certain special disabilities than normal, they are put in the so-called scholar has where special teachers have been fully trained, equipments are made, made available for them so that they will not be left behind in their study. So this is a policy of the government that we want to treat everybody fair. The OKU has been given a fair attention, be it in the form of budget, be it in the form of program, to make sure that they become an important part and citizen of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Tan Sri. Now let's proceed to the next question. Can I have the lady? Ministry of Durham, this fall. Um, I understand that one of the ideology of One Malaysia is unity. And the path towards unity is through ethnic harmony. And the road towards ethnic harmony is culminated by this phrase, acceptance beyond tolerance. Now my question to you, Tan Sri, is what does this phrase mean? And how relevant is it, given the many incidents of racially sensitive issues that has been happening here in Malaysia? Thank you. All right. Thank you for the question. Now, can I have the gentleman on my left in the middle? <clears throat> Good evening, young Ahmad Berhormat. Uh, over the last two days, we've heard many speeches um, presented from the podium, and all of them were very engaging uh, with us. Uh, and comparing that to when you were speaking from the sofa and when you were speaking from the podium, I much more enjoyed it lis listening to your responses uh, because they were so sincere and, and like you were telling them from yourself, from the sofa. My question is this, uh, why don't you write your own speeches so that they seem more sincere and more engaging to the crowd when we are listening to them? Thank you, young Ahmad Bohomad. Can I have time to answer the two questions? Well, thank you very much. I will, of course, want to answer the second one first, but let me answer the first question first on the issue of unity. It is a very important subject. I touched on very briefly just now uh, because I think we could go on and on to debate on this very special subject, but of course, important to all of us. I could reflect, I mean, you could see from this audience that we have today a mix of many ethnics and racial, religious, uh, what are called belief backgrounds, they're all different, but you sit down as one Malaysia, as one Malaysians. This is very important, and no sense of fear, no sense of what are called apprehensions about what will happen to you, 
because you feel this country is safe. I think this is what uh, we have done thus far successfully. So we want to continue with this. Uh, it is not an issue of acceptance. It is an issue of being part of you. It is what the Prime Minister has always been saying. You know, it's not just a question of tolerance. This has been the thing that we said before, that you must tolerate. That the fact that you are Malay and next to you is a Chinese, you must tolerate the Chinese or the Chinese tolerate Malay. Those were the views that we had before. The issues today is not tolerant, it's acceptance that being part and parcel of this country and we all share the same aspiration though we come from different backgrounds. It is what we call diversity but it is also unity in diversity. So there are many ways that how we approach this issue. Of course one is to ensure that there must be a deep sense of respect. The fact that you are different, it is something special. The fact that people don't have the same belief as you are is something special for them. You must accept that. And there must be a deep sense of respect. Because I think if you don't respect what people believe in, you don't respect what they do in their life and how they eat their own ways, that is the most difficult part in trying to develop and nurture a sense of unity. Secondly, of course, is through education. Uh, we, we talk about uh, national education policy. We talk about using the Bahasa Malaysia. Of course, you all go through the system when you are younger. Uh, we talk about uh, communicating. We talk about uh, understanding each other through education. And this, of course, has developed for the many, many years that we have adopting we have adopted the national education policy. Now, aside from this, of course, we also at the same time recognize the fact that there are areas of concern or areas which are sensitive issues. And because of politics or because of certain matters, people tend to go overboard on uh, issues, for example, of race, on issue of religion. You now, in country like Malaysia, of course, this becomes explosive. We wouldn't like to see people, you know, chiding each other just because they're different in terms of the, the color of the skin or because of the, what they believe in. So there must be certain legal, what I call, framework and how you want to ensure that this will not go overboard. So uh, as what maybe Dr. Nazi has mentioned, I'm not too sure the rest of the other members of the administration has come here to explain to you, we must work within the bounds of laws respects and the jurisdictions of legislation that we provided to ensure that there will not be chaos in this country. Now, as I've said earlier, of course, this is a major subject, but Alhamdulillah, I think for the many years that we have been, uh, of course, uh, being Malaysians, we understand each other better, we appreciate each other better. While there are some problems, we acknowledge these are something quite normal in a multi-ethnic society and multi-religious society like Malaysia, but we know where the limits are. And of course, the role of the government and of course the enforcement agency is to ensure that while the respects, the, the rights of each citizen are respected, of course, there are certain bounds, there are certain boundaries and certain areas of uh, respect that you have to uh, what I call acknowledge, and if that is done, of course, we'll be quite happy that we'll be able to preserve the unity that we have today. On the second issue, well, I can speak like this without the tax, but I must make sure when I spoke at that rostrum, I spoke quite correctly. My bahasa is good, but my English must be correct. My point must be, of course, precise. Uh, I could stand there for another one hour to speak on many other issues, but I think it's not because I don't write my speeches, I wrote my speeches, but of course, to ensure that those things are delivered in a very precise manner, I will have to just deliver what I have done just now. <coughs> but of course, um, there are things that uh, we, we could uh, discuss and talk about, and I'm always, of course, uh, uh, what I call, uh, not say very good, but reasonably good to speak in Bahasa. Some people say I spoke like I came from Cambridge, I have no chance to go to Cambridge, I don't come from Oxford. I come from University of Malaya. But okay, it's quite reasonable. People can understand my English. But it's okay. I think uh, what is important is not how you deliver it. I think the content of that delivery, I think, is more important. Thank you.
Jashen. I'm, come, uh, I, I'm from Methodist College, Kuala Lumpur. Dear Deputy Prime Minister, it is now clear that the success of a nation in terms of quality of education, economic performance, success of institutions mainly hinge from the quality of governance. It is thus very important for people to choose wisely their leaders who will be the lawmakers representing them. We will then agree that open public debates on policies by the national prime minister and the opposition leader, such as in US, where the president have, has to um, debate his opponent, is very important to educate the voting class of their choices. Why is it that it, this is not happening here? Will you choose to step up as deputy to debate the opposition leader on national policies? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Now, mm. you can proceed to the gentleman on my right. Very good evening, Tan Sri. Um, my name is Nicholas Lau, and I'm from Furman University in the United States. Um, my question is, as many Malaysians identify ourselves as Malaysian first, do you believe that a Malaysian like myself should be treated as a second-class citizen in my own homeland compared to immigrants who are accorded Bumiputra privileges and status when they become a citizen of Malaysia? Just debate. I think it's a question of how we govern and how we rule this country and how we engage with our people. I think this government, the Barisan National, has of course been entrusted with the power for the last 55 years. Uh, we have uh, introduced many policies, we have implemented many agendas that has changed the lives of people. We believe the people is the arbitral of what government is doing. The people can understand better what government has done for them for the many years. And of course, now that democracy is much more lively, in the sense that opposition feel they now would want to express and exert their influence on general public minds, they have done that all the while. Uh, it's very unusual for a country where after an, uh, an election, for example, a general election, people still go on campaigning. In Malaysia, when election results have been announced, the party like opposition still continue to campaign. So it's okay because uh, this is a democracy. Uh, freedom of speech is very much alive. They can go on telling a lot of things. So what I'm trying to say here, while debate is useful, and there are many forums that you can use to debate, we used parliament, for example, the highest uh, uh, what are called institutions in the country where issues have been raised by oppositions and, of course, prime ministers, deputy prime ministers and ministers, member of administration, of course, the backbenchers engage with them. And, of course, things have been reported very widely, both in the main media and, of course, in the social media. So, debate is ongoing. It's not just like having uh, one person taking one rostrum on one side and another taking one rostrum on the other side. Sometimes it is not really very beneficial to the extent because it's more rhetorics. It's more politics, it's more trying to what I'm, what we what call upmanship sort of stuff. Because you believe that the audience listening to you are very important voters, you want to influence them. So what I'm trying to say now, well, debate could be useful, but of course, continuous engagement with the people is more important. I think this is what we have been doing. The Prime Minister has gone down to the ground, literally sit on the ground, and uh, because we be with them, talk to them, and of course, listening to them. And of course, explaining, exhorting a lot of things that we have been doing in the government. I was down in Johor yesterday in a big crowd of 10,000 people explaining and extolling what uh, we have been doing, we have trying to do, explaining a lot of issues that have been raised. So I think this is much more important so that the public know and exactly understand exactly what the policy of the government is all about. On the issue, we never treat anybody as second citizen. I think it's more an issue of uh, feelings or perception that this government has not been fair or that this government treats someone else more uh, called better than you as Malaysian and those people who become citizens have been treated more, much better than you who has been born as a citizen. I do not think so. Maybe it's an issue, issue of perception. Maybe there's a lot of things which uh, we did not explain well. Because every citizen in this country is a citizen under the Constitution. 
whatever you are, whoever you are. If you are, of course, a Malay, being a Malay, you have got certain rights because that is enshrined in the constitution. But because of the certain rights, it doesn't mean that the Malay gets more than the non-Malays. There are big debates outside to say that we have not been fair, leaving the Chinese unattended, leaving the Chinese not as equally treated as the Malays, for example. This is not true because, uh, as you can see, in terms of economic prosperity, distribution of wealth, whatnot, the Malays have got a certain fair share, the Chinese have got its own fair share. Maybe the Chinese work harder, maybe the Chinese got better opportunities, the Malays did not get that, of course they get better opportunities. Or the Malays who have been supported by the government to ensure that this equity in terms of economic wealth is fairly distributed, we adopted before, of course, the new economic policy. Now it is a national policy. So what I'm trying to say here, of course, it is maybe a misrepresentation but if there's such feeling of being ill-treated, let us know what it is all about. Is it because the Chinese are not being given a fair treatment in terms of education? Does the Chinese uh, not given a fair share of the economic wealth? Uh, the Chinese cannot speak more louder than the Malay or the Indians? Or is the media that represents the Chinese community it been suppressed so that you will not know what's happening? What is it that you feel that has been treated as a second citizen? Now, I think this is something... Uh, important. Uh, I take that as quite uh, indicative of the certain issues of perception that we need to correct. But I think we'll do more. And I think all this while, that the last three years, for example, the Prime Minister has been going down, talking to a lot of community leaders, uh, meet a lot of association, representative of different ethnic groups. We talk to them, we ask them what it is that we can do more. So this engagement process has become now a norm. It is not an exception. So I think by so doing, at least, at least these so-called misconceptions or misrepresentation or perception issues could be corrected. Thank you. Um, excuse me, YB, can I just add on to a question? I would like to clarify that I wasn't talking about um, the multiracial that we have here. I respect the Burmi Putra privileges accorded to the Malays in Malaysia. As a Malaysian, I'm proud of it and that it can stay in whatever how the NEP is being run is run. Um, my question was more of like, for example, in short, um, should an Indonesian migrant who becomes a citizen of Malaysia be given Bumiputra privileges compared to individuals like me uh, who was raised and bred and lived in Malaysia all my life? Should they be given those Bumiputra privileges, let's say a 40-year-old man who was so happened to be Muslim, give, given Bumiputra privileges compared to myself, who was born and lived here for generations after generations? My great-grandfather came down. Thank you. I can understand that. I think, uh, of course, I think uh, not everybody has this so-called uh, entitlement to become citizen. They have to go through a very rigorous process before they can become citizen. And the fact that they become citizen doesn't mean that they be treated much better than the rest. Malaysians, being Malaysians, has first options to be given a fair share, as I said, you know, whether in terms of education, whether in terms of economy, whether in terms of social well-being. I think I do not think that the so-called non bobiptra in Malaysia have been treated less important. Of course, in the constitution, it is spelled out that Bumtra has got special status. What does it mean? Does it mean that bumiputra now fare better than non bumi it can go through many sub-sub-sectors of what are called uh, the development in the country then where you can recognize that the non bumi has sometimes a fair share of whatever they are supposed to share in that sectors. So I think this feeling of being marginalized uh, has to be dealt with. I can appreciate what your sentiments and thinking are, but I do not think that is the correct thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Sri, for the answer. Now, we will have another round of questions. So, let's start with the gentleman on my left. Nasrul, um, it has come to my attention that um, recently in Malaysia, um, due to a shortage of medical, um, well, um, medical expertise, we have um, taken steps to address that. And um, now we have an excess of it. We have 37 medical schools in Malaysia. And um, with that, um, many medical schools, medical students graduating from there, um, and graduating from India, Indonesia, China, uh, sorry, um, Russia, and um, 
the UK, such as myself, um, how, what's the government doing to, to tackle this? Because um, I just went to the hospital the other day and um, the patients are actually being managed um, by shifts. We have a doctor in the morning, in the afternoon and at night, and um, I don't think it's a very, um, I don't think you can actually gain experience from, um, from that. Um, and how can we ensure that the quality of our healthcare in Malaysia will, will be as good as any other country in our region? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Now, can I have the gentleman on my right? Assalamu alaikum Tansri. Good evening, everyone. Um, the teachings of science and math in English was a great move. And I, and I believe a lot of us here, are a product from that. We have taken a great move, a step forward, but unfortunately, we're back to square one. There were a lot of protests by students and parents as well, but what I would like to know, why was this choice made? Was this a popular choice, or are there actually any great benefits behind this uh, particular choice? Because I'm quoting from the CEO of Scali, Tengku Ritaudin. He said that a lot of Asian countries have started um, in the race for economic growth. He said that Myanmar and Indonesia are catching up, and one of the main advantage that Malaysia has is that we speak better English. So with this choice, we are actually contradicting that move, and we are actually you know, losing our competitive advantage against these other countries. All right, Your response you. on that. I'm not too sure exactly uh, when you say that this has been an excess uh, in terms of supplies of the so-called qualified uh, doctors, uh, people in the medical fields uh, in Malaysia. Uh, nurses, of course, they are not doctors. Uh, of course, we know that for sure there has been an excess. What we, of course, is concerned about is quality of healthcare. And to ensure that you have uh, a good healthcare system, you need to have not only good policies, uh, good programs, of course, people who should execute and people who will deliver the so-called health care to our people. And they must be people who are well trained. They come from qualified uh, universities. They, go, they get, go through the whole process before they are graduated, before they graduated, and before they are allowed to practice. Of course, uh, over the years, uh, I had uh, been following this when it was raised many times in the cabinet of certain uh, numbers of students who so-called has graduated from some universities overseas. And then, of course, uh, were not been able to be employed into the Ministry of Health or to practice their, their, their what called their qualifications here simply because they were not able to fulfill certain standards. Uh, they failed to go through certain exams. They were put forward by the medical board. Now, I think that is something very serious. We cannot compromise on the lives of Malaysians. We need doctors who are qualified. And this is the thing which Ministry of Health has been doing. So in order to make sure that this will not happen, of course, one is on the issue of uh, planning of the number of doctors that you need for the number of years ahead, the number of hospitals that you will build. Of course, then you will work out what are the numbers of doctors that you require. Secondly, where do you bring them from? Where do you take them from? The local universities, of course, there are some who go through the medical faculty in Malaysia, but of course, some of them, like you all here, studies abroad. And of course, there are people who have been sent because they have got scholarships. Some do not have scholarships. They do their own sort of uh, uh, courses uh, from pharma, the father and mother scholarships. They went abroad on their own. And sometimes they do not check exactly whether the university that they go to is something that has been recognized by the Ministry of Health. So this is something that we need to avoid from now on. And this is what the Ministry of Health is trying to do. But uh, of, of course, at the same time, it's not easy to manage that. Now, going back to the issue, of course, uh, to make sure there must be quality doctors. Uh, this is something that we always emphasize. We must make sure that uh, they come through qualified universities. They have got fair standards to practice in Malaysia. And of course, they must serve the Malaysian well. Now, the issue of PPSMI, as you might uh, 
no, of course, this is pembelajaran dan pengajaran science and math in English. You said you are the product of that. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, but uh, the reason why there has been a review to this is because one, when uh, it was found after more than six years of this so-called PPSMI, while certain schools actually implement this to the very full, basically they have got good teachers and maths and science have been taught in English because they have got good teachers. But unfortunately, this is also a responsibility of the, my Ministry of Education, the standards of English by our English teachers in schools are not up to the mark. That's one. Secondly, to ask them to teach maths and science, which is not the subject, which is the option, as you call it, options, or the specialization, that is an added problem. Thirdly, when we start doing the survey nationwide to find out what is the outcome of the so-called PPSMI, the urban schools, not all of them, selected schools, is okay. They can understand well because most of the parents are English educated, they communicate well at home, they sometimes speak more English than Bahasa, so there's no problem. But once you go outside of the urban schools, go to the suburban school, go to the rural schools, go to the remote schools, English is zero. I can tell you some of the schools in Sabah and Sarawak, when you have got tests for English, they fail all the time. Simply because, one, is the quality of teachers. Two, for them, English is totally a foreign language. Bahasa Malaysia is not their own language because they don't speak Bahasa. They speak Bidayu, Iban, Kalazan, Dusun. Don't forget, there are all sort of sub-ethnic groups in Malaysia. And they need education. So to tell them English and maths and science, uh, for me, when I was in school, maths and science is not my proper subject because I find it tough. And to teach me in a language which I don't understand make me more difficult. So before we make a decision, we did a thorough study and come up with a full conclusion with a round table to say, if you want to continue with PPSMI, the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that our teachers are up to the mark. Not just English teachers, but of course teachers who can teach maths and science in English. And that we have to go through a long process of upgrading or upskilling these teachers that we have. We need to have the support system. So, but the issue, of course, here is not just maths and science. The issue here is English. You talk about English, okay? I mean, we speak English here, and of course, uh, you are some of you are the product of the pre-PPSMI. Uh, of course, uh, maybe some of you the product of PPSMI. But uh, we talk about English, the standard of English. And I can tell you that the, the, the thing that we need to do, of course, if English is the area of interest and concern of all Malaysians, to make sure that we can be marketable because we can communicate in English, we can understand English. That is the area which I'm looking at. So when I say, well, let's reverse this policy to MBM, MBI, it's not leaving English behind. It is emphasizing the English as a subject. And how do we do it? You study again the curriculum of English, whether this curriculum is suitable for you, whether this curriculum is up to the mark. Secondly, of course, the teachers that will need to teach English must be qualified teachers. So in order to support this teaching staff that we have, I bring in initially about 350-odd teachers from the so-called, uh, from many countries in UK, uh, US, uh, New Zealand, some of those so English-speaking countries, to come here to be master teachers, to see how our teachers that teach English actually perform in classroom. Are they able to deliver or can there be uh, able to make the kids understand in English. So we bring also what we call the Fulbright uh, uh, teaching assistant from US. This is what the Prime Minister wants uh, when he met President Obama. So 50 of them are already inside here. So this is the initial initiative that we need to do to upgrade the standard of English. I am as concerned as you are to see that English standards must be up to the mark. And this is what we are trying to do. So I think while some people are still harping on the so-called PPSMI, I think the issue here is not just PPSMI. It is the ability, the capacity, the proficiency, the standard of teaching staff that we have. And what we need to do, of course, is not just reversing, is to focus on English language. This is uh, what we have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Sri. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we only have enough time to take 
two more questions from Mr. Four. So um, let's start with the gentleman. A very good evening to everyone else. Um, I would like to know how does education fit in the transformation program of this country? Will there be any foundational changes to our primary and secondary education? Thank you. All right. Thank you for the question. Now we'll have one last question from the lady on my right. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Amanda, and uh, I'll be doing a law degree in UCL Bristol. Um, my question to Tan Sri is, are there any plans to revamp or scrap Pendidikan Moral? Because as a product of public school for 11 years, I failed to understand how memorizing um, definition of morals has helped inculcate any moral values to myself. So, thank you. It's part and parcel of this so-called major transformation policy that government is now undertaking. Uh, because we talk about, importantly, to develop the human capital that will fit in the much needed uh, uh, sectors. Uh, we have got the 12 NKEA as we know it. I think you should know by now. Uh, we need numbers of people who are qualified and they have to be trained. So uh, that has to come in from your education system. And this system is so important for us. Now, while I'm talking now, there is this major exercise of uh, review of our education system. I just closed a national dialogue which we had uh, for the last three months in Johor Bahru yesterday, where we start engaging with more than 10,000 people from various walks of life, representing various communities, representing the NGOs, the educationists. They have submitted their views and their thinkings and thought on how to improve uh, further our education system. So it is very much an important component of this major transformation that we talk about. So uh, what, uh, what will be the changes? Now, of course, uh, I am focusing on nine areas. I could mention just a few, of course. The first and most important, which you all will agree, is the teacher. Uh, when we talk education, it goes back to the very basic thing. The teacher must be qualified and good teacher. So a lot of uh, views coming out from the floor in all the dialogue sessions that we have among the top subjects they teach about is quality teaching staff that you must have. Uh, so that is one thing we're looking at. Secondly, of course, the, uh, the role of the ministry itself, the budget that we have. Thirdly, of course, the area of infrastructure. Fourthly, the role of parents and community. So we have identified nine major areas, and these are the areas that we're looking at at the same time. But while we do that, of course, uh, we have started doing this since... Uh, earlier part of this year. This is the final stage before we go and prepare the blueprint. The Prime Minister will launch the blueprint, inshallah, in August next month. And uh, from there on, of course, we'll have a few open days to allow the public to engage with what we have done so far. And before that, of course, after that, we'll go to the Cabinet. And once Cabinet has accepted this, there will be a full new report of our national education uh, system. Uh, whether it involves any major shift or changes, you just have to wait for that. Um, you are asking me whether there should be any revamp on Pandidikan morale. I tend to agree to that, I must say, because um, some people would feel that uh, while the Muslim will take the Pandidikan Islam, the non-Muslim goes to another class to take Pandidikan morale. I have gone through what are the content of Pandidikan morale, and some people feel it's just like memorizing, some like knowing uh, what I call the teaching and, uh, of course, preaching by some uh, religious uh, figures. So uh, maybe there is a need for us to review that. I do hope that in this process that I mentioned earlier, there is some exercise to look at the Pandidikan morale as much as we're looking to the other subject as well. And what, uh, it's not just a title, which is Pendidikan Moral. What is the content of that Pendidikan Moral? So if there is a need for us to revamp it, there is a need for us to improve upon what we have in that Pendidikan Moral, we will do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tan Sri. Now, ladies and gentlemen, can we please have another round of applause for Tan Sri Mujin Yassin, the Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia. I will now pass the mic to the MC. Thank you, Mr. Shawal. 
Uh, now I'd like to invite UKC's chairman, Mr. Shawal himself, to present a token of appreciation to Yang Ahmad Bahagia, Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived to the end of the evening. The UKC committee would like to extend its deepest gratitude to everyone present in the duration of the two days of this event. We also hope that everyone here will get involved with UKC's various projects. As you now carry the responsibility of ensuring that the metamorphosis of Malaysia materializes, we hope that the word of unity and advancement spreads around the nation. With that, thank you and have a pleasant evening.